One of the things that I love about spending time in, in the woods is that when you start to become really attuned to all the beings that are around you, you realize that they're here for a reason. You can look at the woods and, and start to see stories that are present in, in the woods. Bonjour. In our beautiful Potawatomi language, I've introduced myself. I am Robin Wall Kimmerer, um, Anishinaabe woman, um, member of the Bear Clan and of the Eagles, um, and member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. I am a professor of environmental biology at the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry uh, here in Syracuse, New York. I'm a botanist, a plant ecologist, and, and also the director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment. I chose for us to meet here at the Clark Reservation State Park in Jamesville, New York, because at this time of year when the snow has just begun to melt and spring is thinking about arriving, this is one of the best places to see those first signs of spring. You know, right here it comes to mind, we're walking on this path and this little evergreen vine here, you think, oh well, yeah, that's nice and green on the ground. But in fact, this is telling us a story. This, and you can see the way it's, it's uh, just one patch of this. This tells us that this was an old home site. Um, this is a, a little periwinkle vine. It's a exotic species, doesn't really belong in the woods, and yet, it's part of the story of the place because it's telling us that uh, there were people here before who valued this plant and they put it here and it has, has survived. The park was made here because it's spectacular geological formation. This is beautiful limestone ledges and sculpted pavements of limestone where the glacier passed over here and created a huge waterfall which created the lake, scoured out the limestone, and there's so many plants that love to live on that, that damp limestone. So it's a, it's a favorite place of mine to come and teach and come in and watch the unfolding of the season. You look around you and it's, it's not just a, an assemblage of, 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 of trees and green things, but, but it's, a, it's, it's a whole story. You know, as I'm walking around here, I do love to pay attention to the little things, but this time of year, when there aren't any leaves out and the flowers aren't up yet, you get to really see all of the textures and colors of the place. You know, back here is a, another tree that's telling a story. Look at this. This is a shagbark hickory right here with those great big platy bark on it. And you know, when you see that, you know something about the history of this place. It's nuts, which are delicious, only grows in bright sun in open places. So this tells you that this is not an old forest. This is a young forest coming back from some kind of, of disturbance. It also tells you when you see um, uh, shagbark hickories, this is the place to be in the fall. Delicious food um, from the hickory nuts, a really important traditional food of indigenous peoples in this uh, uh, habitat. This piece of land is part of the ancestral and the contemporary territories of the Onondaga Nation, the central fire of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And this state park is um, a favorite of residents of Syracuse. There are miles of hiking trails and it's great birding and botanizing. So um, it's a place which is well loved by, by residents of the region. One of the reasons I, I love to bring my students here is, is um, these beautiful mossy ledges that all of this limestone was scraped bare by the glacier. And without any soil on it, 
For the most part, the rooted plants can't grow. And then it makes these, these gorgeous habitats for all of the mosses. And you might at first just look around you and say, okay, there's a green carpet on the rocks. But when your eye starts to become tuned and you, you, know, you use all of your senses, you realize that there's no such thing as just moss. It's mosses. There's all these different kinds. And I mean, just look in here and the thousand shades of green. There's, there's the bright lime green and the rusty orange green and the brownie green and the bright grass green, the shiny ones, the dull ones. Every one of them is a different species. And it starts to just draw you in closer and closer to see how they, they live their lives. Um, they're, just, they're just amazing. I, I come to this place often and particularly as a teaching landscape because it's a place where the geology and the botany and the birds and the people all um, come together and it's a place to be able to teach natural history, ecology and cultural relationship as well. You know for me all of the plants are, are teachers, they're, they're, they have things that we could learn from them and the, the mosses are the oldest plants on earth. And if you look at the fossils of mosses and you look at contemporary mosses, they haven't changed very much. So what we're talking about here is that the oldest plants on the planet are right here. And that means that these plants that have existed since plants even came onto the land have endured every climate change that has ever happened on earth. They have endured when most organisms have gone extinct, the mosses have endured. So you have to look at these and say, well, how did you do it? What lessons do you have for us mosses about how we could live? Um, how do we adapt and how are we resilient in the face of the, of the changes that, that are upon us? One of the answers that the mosses have for you is, is simplicity. They ask very little of their environment and they give a lot back. It may just look like a green blanket, but they're harboring so much biodiversity. They're called the coral reef of the forest for all the little critters that live in these tiny little moss forests. They make soil, they purify water, they create habitats for other, they give a lot and don't take much. They live simply, they don't change the environment, they live within the environment. And so then we ask ourselves, well, how did they persist through every climate change that has ever been on the planet? Well, that's how, being small, adaptable, and, and not changing the environment, but adapting to the environment. A place like this is an opportunity to really listen to the land and really slow down and watch and engage with the life unfolding around you. And that practice, that muscle, if you will, of paying attention to the land and learning from the land is something that we have started to lose because of all the time we spend on digital media, all the time we spend inside. I fear that we're forgetting how to really engage with the land, to listen and to learn from the land as, as, as our teacher. But the good thing about that is that all you have to do is be in the presence of that teacher. All you have to do is be outside and, and, and pay attention and open all of your senses to the world around you. And um, those, those skills and abilities are latent. They're waiting to be woken up. So all it takes is, is the time and, and that beautiful gift of human attention. Oh, look, here's these, these nice ribbon leaf sedges. They're, one, they're evergreen under the snow. Um, but oh, look, there's the new growth of these ribbon leaf sedges coming. They're some of the earliest to come up. Oh, and you can just feel how warm those leaves are. Even though there was snow here uh, just a couple of days ago, that, that southern exposure in the sun is warming things right up. This beautiful um, tree really uh, calls to me because um, in our language, this is a basswood, also known as the American linden. And um, the basswood in our language we call wingo which is the string tree. 
And in the underneath the bark, there are these sheets of fibers that our people routinely would harvest to use as cordage, as, as rope and twine for uh, tying everything together, for weaving into fabrics and, and bags and containers. Um, so it's, a, it's a, a tree that you really like to see in the forest. You might just walk by it and, and say, well, you know, it's just a big old gray tree, but in fact, it's, it's, it, it bears these amazing gifts. In fact, I like this tree so much. It has these beautiful, fragrant flowers in, um, in the springtime. Uh, it's such a generous and beautiful tree that I named my daughter after this tree. Um, her name is Lyndon, so um, I didn't name her Basswood. That wouldn't be a very pretty name. But <laughs> As a professor, I try to get my students out onto the land just as often as I can. Sometimes we're, we're indoors, we're, we're learning online, of course, this year, and, um, and learning from books. That's, that's all good, but there is absolutely no replacement from, for learning from the land herself. Um, you learn, you know, to, to exercise all of your faculties, not just the intellect, right? Not just your mental powers of, of learning how the world is, but to feel how the world is, to sense it, to, to develop a relationship with, with the living world. We know that we learn so much better when we're engaging our memories, when we're engaging story, when we're engaging our aesthetic senses. And um, I'm sorry, but that just doesn't happen so much in a textbook. And, and so to me, the, the place to learn to be a biologist, to learn to be a naturalist is on the land. And once you come to know the different beings that are around you, you also, you see not only stories, but the way that the land cares for you. Just standing in this place, I see the food of the hickory, the food of the maples, the string of the basswood, and I see medicine. Right here in front of us, that black flaky bark is a black cherry. And did you ever wonder why cough drops almost always come in black cherry flavor? <laughs> because black cherry is a cough medicine. And the, the bark of the twigs of that tree boiled down, make a really good soothing cough medicine. And so yes, you look at the world as full of biodiversity and these amazing beings living their lives, but they also are in relationship with us. And you see the cedars, really good respiratory medicine. We'll get close to one later. We came by a hemlock, which is super good for uh, colds. It has tons of vitamin C in it. Um, so they're medicines. They're, they're medicines all around us to be honored, to be respected. And in fact, um, in our Potawatomi language, the word for plants is mishkakin, which means the medicines, but it also means, if you take that word mishkakin apart, it means the strength of the earth. And so when we talk about plants healing us, they're healing us with the strength of the earth. And to feel that and to feel all those gifts that are all around you makes the woods into a, a very different place. The Potawatomi language, of which is the language of my ancestors and which I am a beginning student, is full of sounds that to me sound like the land. There's lots of double consonants, zhs and shs, that sound just like the wind that's surrounding us. There, there are sounds that um, are like waves on, 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 on uh, rocks. And so it's a language that to me sounds like the sounds of the, of the natural world. And our language, we say, is, a, is, is, is sacred to the, to the people because it was a, a gift to us. You know, when we talk about the stories that the land holds, we had a recent story. There was a homestead here. We have an ancient story right here where the snow is lying there later than any place else in this cold, wet little uh, drainage. Look at the cliffs up above it. This is an old plunge pool from a great river. Up here on this cliff, the river that was draining uh, glacial Lake Iroquois came tumbling over these cliffs. And this little basin is where the, the power of the water carved out um, this, this little basin. 
and um, today it, it's filled it with water only in the in the springtime and a great place for frogs and salamanders and 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 spring peepers living in the remnants of that of that ancient uh, glacial river one of the greatest sources of biodiversity in woods like this are of course the fungi who are busy decomposing all the leaves and the wood and on this old tree base here is one that I think is, is very common and but but really beautiful it's called the turkey tail fungus for the way it comes in these little banded um, colored fans like like an expanded turkey tail these are wood destroyers. They're busy bringing this back down to, to humus. And down here, you can see up here, they're you know gray and rusty. And down here where they're green, these are algae that are living on top of them. So everything, everything has, a, has its own niche, including living on others. And you know, while this fungus, the turkey tail, is doing its work in the forest. It's also a medicine. It's a, um, a traditional uh, medicine that, that is used for the immune system, for, for fighting off infections. That's a great one. Let's see what else we can find here. <laughs> my, my friends and family tease me about these stories because, you know, you might previously just walk through the woods thinking, I'm just going for a hike and I'm, and, you know, I'm going to move right along. They say, Robin, when we hike with you, we don't ever get very far <laughs> because you always have to stop and, and look at everything and say, why are you here? Um, but it, it is a, an, it, for me, it makes it a really rich um, experience. This past couple of days, we've had warm winds from the south, and so the beginning of the songbird migration is um, uh, upon us. Uh, just yesterday, there were killdeer in the sky, and um, the morning doves began singing, the robins began singing. So um, yes, uh, this is, is a really special time of year to see all of those who have left us for the winter starting to come back. Whoa, look at this. Um, this, this old maple has been worked by a, a pileated woodpecker. When you see those long oblong shapes, that tells you it's a, a, a pileated woodpecker with that really big, strong jackhammer of a beak that's been working that tree trunk to, to get bugs and grubs out. And whoa, it has been so busy. Look at all this, these shards down here, the whole base of the tree covered with these chunks that have been knocked out by, by the woodpecker. That's a good source of winter food, right? The bugs that are, that are under the bark. Oh yeah, you can see where all the little insect holes here are too. There's some good food in there if you're a woodpecker. One of the consequences of spending time on the land and paying attention to birds and trees and berries and roots and grasses and bugs and all of the things that are around you is you start to think about the world as full of persons, of more than human persons. And that they're bringing us these gifts of, of the, um, the joy of watching them, the foods that they provide for us, everything that they have to teach us. In our traditional culture, we say that the, the chickadees um, are always talking to the people. They're very social birds. They come around people. They um, really like to be in multi-species flocks. They, they go about the, the woods with other species in this sort of um, convivial little gatherings. And um, we're told that we should always pay attention when the chickadees speak to us. And there are a lot of old stories about the chickadees talking about uh, changes in the weather, warning people about things that are um, uh, on the wind, as it were. And you know that those old stories that say that we could learn from the birds and, 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 and benefit from their counsel is something that gets dismissed as fairy tales or, or, or folklore. But when you really do start to listen and hear all the different voices. Chickadees, for example, have something like 40 different calls. They're, they're not just making noise, they're talking to each other, and, and why not talking to, to us as well? A lot of the, the um, old teachings and, and, and stories are, 
are being um, verified, if you will, by, by Western science today. Not that they had to be verified, they were true all on their own. I think that once we start to see the world as, as gifts from more than human relatives, then it brings us to gratitude for the gifts of the land. And my hope and challenge to all of us is that as we give gratitude to the land, could we also shape our lives so that we live in such a way that the land might be grateful for us.